Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman and we're taking a look today at a new mini PC from Azul. This is the Byte 3. It costs about $200 as you see it and uh, it is a fanless device running with a new Intel Apollo Lake processor. We're going to take a closer look at this in just a second, but I do want to mention in the interest of full disclosure that this did come in free of charge from Azul. However, all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review and no one is reviewing this content before it is posted. Let's take a closer look now at the hardware. Uh, this has got an Intel Apollo Lake N3450 processor built in. 4 gigabytes of RAM on this one, and unfortunately only 32 gigabytes of eMMC storage. Uh, they will be releasing an 8 gigabyte model. That one too will only have 32 gigabytes of built-in storage, but they did offer a lot of ways to expand that onboard storage. So we took this apart on the extras channel the other day. Uh, you can install your own SATA drive, a full-size you know, notebook style SSD or spinning drive. Uh, you can also put in an M2 SATA drive. So you can add two different hard drives to this thing and really uh, extend out its storage if you are using it for media serving or that kind of thing. Uh, the antenna here is pretty obvious. It supports Wi-Fi, of course, but it doesn't support AC, just A, B, G, and N. Uh, but it does work over 5 gigahertz network, so you have that going for you there. Uh, the heatsink here on the top is uh, what it uses to get rid of all of its heat. So there's no fan in here, and uh, this will heat up quite a bit. It will get warm to the touch. And uh, one thing we did discover in our testing is that it doesn't really do so great of a job of preventing throttling, especially when you're playing games on it. So we did run the uh, 3D Mark stress test on this one, and it got a failing grade of 78%. 97% is passed. So I think if you're playing games on this, you know, games that really tax the hardware, uh, you will see a performance decline the hotter it gets. Uh, we did not have the same experience with home theater, which I'll talk about a little later in the review. Let's take a look at some of the ports on here. You've got some air over here. There's no fan again, but it does need some uh, air here to cool things off apparently. On the back is where you got most of the ports. You got two USB 3.0 ports over here, gigabit ethernet, HDMI out, VGA out if you're still using some of the older standards there. Uh, your 12 volt power adapter goes in there. This is what it looks like here. It's uh, slotted for additional markets and not too bad of a cord here. It is uh, 12 volts at 2 amps, so if you are trying to keep track of your power consumption, you'll have it there. Uh, there's also a USB Type-C connector. Uh, they said in the documentation that this is a Gen uh, 2 connector in that it can support up to 10 gigabits per second, but it is data only. I wasn't able to verify if it is running that fast, but uh, that's what they say it is. Uh, so you just get data over this, no video or power. It would have been kind of cool if it supported all those things because you could plug in a single cable into a dock and have your uh, computer up and running. Over here is your headphone jack, and of course you've got a Kensington lock for preventing people from walking away with your computer here. Uh, you've got a few more USB ports on the side, a uh, USB 2 here, another USB 3, and you've got a card reader. Uh, what we found is I like to use these Logitech keyboards that have those little dongles on them, and uh, when I had it attached to the back, I wasn't getting good signal from the uh, dongle for the keyboard, partly because of the heat sink here, I think, blocking the signal. So we had much better luck plugging our dongle uh, into the side there. Uh, one other note is on the front. There's a little sensor here in the front, and that's because they also pack in a remote control for the $200 price tag. Not a bad little remote. It's not all that useful in that you can't use it as an air mouse, but it does allow you to navigate things like Kodi and uh, other multimedia applications fairly well. So once you get into those things, you can use the remote, although I do recommend having some kind of living room keyboard that you can use to uh, access the computer when you are uh, out of an application that is remote friendly. Let's take a look now and see how this thing performs. So let's start things off with some web browsing. We've got my YouTube channel here running a 1080p video at 60 frames per second. It seems to be working just fine if you use the Edge browser. I've talked about some of the reasons why Edge is a little better for YouTube on these uh, low-end PCs, but we're able to get that video to play back just fine there. Uh, we also did some web browsing and multimedia rich sites do load up very quickly. Having four gigs of RAM on board does help a little bit with having multiple tabs open at the same time. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention earlier when I talked about upgradability is that unfortunately you can't upgrade the RAM on this one, just the storage. So if you are uh, in need of more RAM, you might want to wait for them to release the eight gigabyte version of this. And on the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test running in Google Chrome, we got a score of 32.55. 
That puts it right within the margin of error of uh, two other laptops that we've looked at running with the same processor. So performance-wise, it is doing what we expect it to do, which is uh, provide a fairly decent web browsing experience for the price point. It also did a very passable job of running Microsoft Word with our multimedia-rich template we like to run on it. So I think if you're doing basic tasks, this will run uh, those tasks just fine. It actually performs quite nicely for a $200 computer, and it's been very interesting to see how Intel's been developing the low end of their product line uh, while they're also developing the higher end stuff too. Great performance for basic tasks. So let's move on to some games, and we're starting off with Minecraft here, as you can see. We got frame rates at around 20 to 30 frames per second running at 1080p, about where I would expect this one to line up. Uh, we also ran Half-Life 2, which is an older game, but as I have mentioned over the last couple of weeks, older games do very well on these cheap little PCs, and Half-Life 2 was getting frame rates around 38 to 116 frames per second, depending on what was going on uh, within the game there. So I think for a lot of basic gaming, very basic gaming, uh, you'll do okay here, although we did see a lot of throttling going on, especially when the uh, processor was being taxed. Although it is fanless and it's got a great big heat sink on the top of it, it's not enough to keep the processor from throttling back under significant load. So I think if you are looking at this as a little gaming box, it's probably not the best choice. You might want to look at an Intel NUC or something that does have a fan to uh, cool it off on there. We also ran the 3D Mark CloudGate test, a benchmark test, and there we got a score of 2067. Uh, that does put it pretty close to what we've seen on other N3450 machines like the Aspire 1 laptop we looked at a few weeks ago, although the graphics are a little behind where we saw that laptop end up. And my uh, theory on that is that the Azul here is running its RAM in single channel mode, uh, which is going to affect the graphics performance a little bit on the Apollo Lake processor. I believe the Acer had its RAM in dual channel mode, so it was running slightly faster on that benchmark test. But uh, by and large, for what you might notice in a game, it'll probably be about the same. So decent performance here and a nice uptick in performance over the prior generation low-cost chips from Intel. So let's take a look now at home theater performance. We'll begin with Cody and the Jellyfish test file that is an HEVC encoded video 4K at 10 bit, 140 megabits per second. Uh, this does tend to run pretty well on Apollo Lake processors, but not so great on this one. We did have a few skip frames here in the video and a bunch more when we did some further testing on it. So some of the higher end HEVC files may not do as well. When we did hook this up to a 4K TV running at the native 4K resolution, uh, we did get a lot of dropped and skip frames. Uh, we also saw similar behavior with Blu-ray MKV files. Uh, those are all at 1080p, and when we tried to play them back at 4K, even at 24p, we were getting a lot of skip frames. So I think the target on this device is going to be uh, 1080p for your movie playback. Uh, the good news, though, is that it supports lossless audio. So DTS HD and Dolby True HD uh, both work out of the box here, which was great. And if you do wish to hook it up to a 4K display for uh, Microsoft Word and some other lighter tasks, it does support 60 hertz out of the back of that HDMI port. That's not something I always see on these low-end PCs, so that was good uh, to be able to get that 60 frames per second, but I think you're going to have a hard time getting video files to keep up at that frame rate. Uh, we were seeing a lot of uh, drop frames and skip frames on here. So I do think it's a good home theater box, provided you stick to 1080p and, of course, keep it uh, uh, all the vents here clear so that it can get uh, some of its airflow going because, again, it doesn't have a fan, so you do need to uh, make sure you've got plenty of airflow for this one. And one last thing to check out, and that is alternative operating systems. We booted up Ubuntu on it, version 17.10, and as you can see here, it loaded up just fine. The video worked audio worked, Wi-Fi worked, networking worked, everything that I plugged into it seemed to work on Ubuntu. Uh, we've seen good performance on other Apollo Lake devices too, so it checks those boxes. So if you do want to install a variant of Ubuntu or another uh, Linux-based operating system, I think you'll have good luck with it. Uh, just uh, be sure to go into the BIOS and uh, set it up for that because you do have to go in and tell it you've got a Linux operating system that you're trying to boot. Uh, my initial attempts were thwarted, but after I set that BIOS uh, setting, it seemed to work uh, just fine after that. So all in, not a bad little device, especially if you are doing a lot of 1080p video playback. It seemed to perform quite well doing that. I like that it does support the lossless audio formats too. Uh, my only concern with this one is 
heat dissipation. It does seem to heat itself up pretty decently, and uh, we were seeing some throttling on the stress test that we ran. So I think if you are planning to push the limits on this one, you will see a performance degradation. Uh, you might want to look at one of these Apollo Lake PCs that comes with a fan. Uh, the Intel NUC is one worth considering, perhaps. So uh, just keep that in mind. You can't upgrade the RAM, but you can put in a lot of storage, which is very good. And I didn't notice this when I was going through my evaluation, but it does have a Windows 10 Pro license on this one. So uh, you will get a little more Windows functionality out of it, and it might uh, do better in a, a small business environment as a result of that. So uh, pretty good for basic tasks, pretty good for 1080p stuff, but uh, just be cautious if you are looking to do some gaming or other heavy-duty tasks with this $200 device. This is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Black Eyed and Blues Music Hour podcast, Chris Allegretta, John Prawl, William Miller, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.